You know, this morning it kind of feels like the first regular service here in this building because the gentleman that's with us this morning spoke that first morning that we ministered out of this room. So we have with us Robert Henderson, apostle that travels all over the world. I've been following him lately. He just pops from one country to another country to another country because God said. He had a, a, a cushy church. He had a, a, a church of, was it, am I right, about five, five, six, seven hundred and, and uh, in, the, in the Dallas area and, and, uh, and it had it'd been going real well for a time and, and uh, but God said, and that's always the important thing, but God said, take your apostolic gift and go to the world. And that's what he's been doing these last years. We met Robert Henderson in Dallas a, a few years ago and have quickly become friends. Um, enjoyed his our times of fellowship uh, my gifting of course is is apostle and so we kind of click together and and uh, and so i want you to put your hands together and welcome robert henderson apostle thank you <laughs> thank you so much bless you thank you thank you good morning it's good to be back here in prince albert I was here a couple of years ago, I think it was now, and, and so I'm so privileged to get to be a part of um, what the Lord's doing here. Uh, Apostle Glenn mentioned about me traveling around. I was just, let me, I was sitting there thinking, this time last week I was in Lagos, no, no, Abuja, uh, Nigeria. Uh, and, and, but before then I had been in, in Lagos, and then uh, before that I was in Germany, and before that I was in Norway. Uh, and then I was back in Germany, and then I was down at the Nigeria. Um, um, my wife sometimes asks me, she's, we've been married for 38 years, be 39 this year, and uh, we have uh, six kids and five grandchildren. And uh, uh, like someone said, sometimes people don't like me saying this, but I, we've discovered that grandchildren are God's reward for not killing your kids. And so uh, <laughs> we love our children, but we definitely love our grandchildren. And so some, I said, I said some of the best things about having kids is grandkids. And so uh, we have five of them, and uh, they, keep our, they keep us entertained, if nothing else. Um, but uh, uh, Apostle Glenn mentioned that I was from the Dallas area. We actually pastored, uh, led up an apostolic center, raised up an apostolic center, and led it for 15 years in a place called Waco, Texas. Anybody ever heard of Waco? See, people say, why did you leave Waco? I said, they burnt my compound down. I had to leave. <laughs> and so, and, and then everybody looked at me is he serious? No, <laughs> it, it, wasn't, it wasn't our compound. But anyway, we were there when all that happened and everything. And so, but we saw God do a great work there in, in, uh, in the Waco area. We saw an apostolic center raised up, as Apostle Glenn said, of five or 600 people. We saw, we had, we were, I was on TV five, or, five times a week locally and nationally and internationally and then we had a bible school we had about 10 churches that had been planted uh, from that church that uh, that we were apostolic uh, over and uh, so we had a lot of good things going on there and god literally said to me now i want you to hand this off and i want you to go to the nations and so that was almost 10 years ago this year in october will be 10 years ago that that happened and uh we did not know the transition that that would that would throw us into uh, as a family and all of that sort of thing. But anyway, we we've enjoyed the journey, continue to enjoy the journey, and expect God to uh, literally use us to see the kingdom of God established uh, as He would allow throughout the earth. Amen. And so, what I want to do this morning is I want to talk to you. Uh, I, I think I probably did this a little bit last time I was here because I probably talked about the apostolic, the ecclesia, the ecclesia, but I also probably talked about the courts of heaven, which is one of the main things that people have come to associate me with is the courts of heaven. And let me just real briefly, just, just say something real briefly, and I'm going to move to what I want to say today. You need to know that, I, that in the book of Luke in particular, Jesus placed prayer in three different realms. He placed it in approaching God as Father in Luke 11 and verse 2. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. When his disciples asked him, 
to teach them to pray. He said, you, you approach God as Father. And then in Luke 11, 5 through 8, he said, in which of you having a friend? So the second realm of prayer is we approach God as friend. And that's different. See, we, we approach God as Father, um, in, literally for our own needs, but we approach God as friend because God is now able to share the secrets of his heart with us. That's, the, that's what characterizes a friend, is the secrets that are shared between friends. And so we approach him as father, we approach him as friend, but then in Luke 18, Jesus in the book of Luke finishes up his discourse on teaching on prayer, and he talks about us coming before, or he talks about a widow coming before an unjust judge. And that this widow was able to get a verdict from an unjust judge, even though he didn't regard man and he didn't fear God. And the whole moral of that particular parable in Luke 18, 1 through 8 is simply this, that if this widow could get a verdict from an unjust judge, how much more can we go before our righteous judge and see him render verdicts in our behalf? And so, so the whole issue is this, that, God put, or that Jesus put prayer in three realms. First of all, approaching God as Father. Secondly, approaching Him as friend. But thirdly, approaching Him as judge and learning how to step in that third dimension of the court system of heaven. Now, I'm not going to teach all that today. We'll see how we go over the next few services. But I do want to just jump off of that. And by the way, the, the book that I have here talks about all of that and everything in it. But I want to, what I want to do is I want to show you a scripture in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, and verses 9 and 10. Daniel 7 and verse 9 and 10. And I just want to begin to try to unveil some things for us this morning in regards to the books of heaven and the destinies that are written in those books. But I want to connect it to us approaching God as, as judge in that third dimension of prayer. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9 and 10. Here's what he said. I watched till thrones were put into place. Daniel's seeing this. And the Ancient of Days was seated... Uh, his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheel a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousands, thousands ministered to him. Ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. So he is literally seeing the same thing Ezekiel saw, the same thing Isaiah saw, the same thing John saw in the book of Revelation. He's seeing the exact same thing. Now watch this. And he says, well, watch what he says. And he says, and the court was seated and the books were open. So everything he's seeing, John calls the court or the court of heaven, if you will. So in other words, whenever we talk about coming before God as judge into a judicial system, we're talking about us taking our place in that sphere that John calls the court of heaven. Because you need to understand that even though our feet is on this carpet, when we pray, the Bible says we have been seated together with Him in heavenly places. And so, so even though I might be praying, it would appear from the earth with my feet on this carpet, in reality, in the Spirit, I take my place in the third heaven in that dimension called the court of heaven and step into the judicial system of heaven that, that, that Jesus was speaking of when he said we should approach God as a judge. Now, the whole reason I'm saying that is it says the court was seated, and watch what he says, the books. Everybody say books. The books were open. Okay, why is that important? Because Psalms 139 verse 16 says something very important. It says that, that all my substance yet unformed and all my days yet unfashioned were written down in the book of heaven. Okay, and this is important because you need to understand, if our eyes were opened into the spirit realm, we would be amazed because the spirit realm is filled with books and scrolls. Now, scrolls and books are the same things in scriptures. So, so he says that all my substance yet unformed. What does that mean? Here's what it means. It means, this is what I believe it means, my DNA. In other words, what makes me think the way I think? What makes me like the things I like? What makes me not like the things I don't like? What makes me good at one thing, but not so good at another thing? How I many you know that's what makes us different from each other? And so he says, my substance that makes, that determines all of that stuff was written in a book before I ever existed in the earth. See, listen, we spend our entire days discovering 
what was written in the book of heaven about us and figuring out who we really are in the planet. That's, that's literally what we do. We spend all of our days doing this. And then it says, am I days yet unfashioned? What does that mean? That means how long I will live and what I'm supposed to accomplish in that span of years. It was written in the book of heaven. Now, why am I saying all that? Because God wants us to understand that we were put in the planet to fulfill what was written in the books of heaven about us. That there is a book in the spirit realm, in heaven, that chronicles your destiny and your purpose. So let me make a statement here. Somebody says, well, what's in the books? Well, there's a lot of different kind of books, but the books I'm talking to you about today is simply this. What is in the books of heaven are destinies, purpose, what you exist for. And watch this. It's not just books about individuals. There's books about churches. There's books about businesses. There's books about cities. There's books about provinces. There's books about nations. Watch. Anything that has a destiny... A God-ordained destiny, there is a book in heaven about it. It's that simple. That if, if, if there's a kingdom purpose attached to something, there's a book in heaven. And I tell people this, if there's not a book in heaven about it, don't waste your time on it. Why? Because it has no value to the kingdom. It has no eternal value. So every person that was ever born into the planet... Whether they're lost, whether they're saved, it doesn't matter. Every person that was ever born, they have a book in heaven about them. Now watch this. It is our job to discover what is in those books and see them become a reality. Now let me, let me just kind of walk you through that for just a moment. You see, in, in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, the Bible says that, that, that uh, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon... Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. But here's what he, here's what he says. He says, Satan has desired to have you or ask for you. Okay, that word in the Greek, just look it up. In the Greek, here's what it means. It literally means he has demanded you be put on trial. That's what that word means. That literally, Satan demanded a trial date concerning Peter in the courts of heaven, watch this, to try to stop Peter from getting what was in his book. Because if he got what was in his book, Peter was going to change history. Peter was going to alter history on the planet. Peter was going to do massive damage to the empire of Satan, and he was going to push the kingdom of God forward. So what was Satan's strategy? To take Peter to court in the courts of heaven. To, he had a case against him. And watch this. Say before God, I have evidence in the courts of heaven that says Peter does not qualify to have what's in his book. That's literally what's going on there. Now watch this. What am I trying to get you to see? If you have a kingdom purpose, I promise you, this scenario plays its way out in your life. And this is why everywhere I go, everywhere I go, this is what I find. People that are frustrated. Why are they frustrated? Because they intuitively know I was made for something more than I've accomplished. There's just this intuitiveness about us that we are supposed to have done more, accomplished more, seen more happen than what we've actually seen happen. Anybody say, that's me. Okay? See, I always say this. Everybody raises their hand, and those that didn't are lying. Because I promise you, everywhere I go, 100% of people feel this way. Here's why. Because Satan has a case against you that literally is stopping you from getting the fullness of what was written in the books of heaven about you. Because you and I are here to fulfill everything that was written in the books about us before time again. Now let me explain this a little further. See, in Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 7, 
the scripture said Jesus is prophesying about himself. And he says that when he came unto the earth, he said. In other words, he, he, he spoke about himself. He prophesied about himself. He said that when he came into the earth, he said, burnt offering and sacrifice you didn't want, but you prepared for me a body. Okay, remember that he, you prepare for me a body. In other words, you made a body for me. You, you raised up a nation. You raised up a virgin out of that nation. You, you impregnated her so that she could carry a body in her womb so that there would be a body that Jesus could come into the planet with. Because he said you no longer wanted burnt offerings and sacrifice. You prepared a body that would ultimately be offered on a cross that would purchase and bring back redemption to creation now watch this he said so you prepared a body for me because you didn't want burnt offering and sacrifice anymore now watch what he says he says i have now come it is written of me in the volume of the book to do your will O god see what's he saying he's saying the reason i have come in a body into the earth is so i can flesh out in this body what was written about me in a book in heaven that even Jesus had a book in heaven about him. Now, you say, well, why would Jesus need a book about what he was to do in the earth? Because he had to be just like you and I in every dimension. You see, you need to know that when Jesus walked the earth, he never did one thing as God. He did everything as a man filled with God. Because if he did anything as God, he forfeited his right to be the savior of the earth because a man lost creation, a man had to win it back. So Jesus never did anything as God. In fact, Philippians 2 says he laid aside his godhood and he lived with the same limitations that we live with. Why? So that he could in every way be just like you and me. So that the same limitations that are on us, he lived with in, mar in a mortal body. Watch this. So that as a man, he could win creation back that Adam lost. Are you getting that? See, this is very important. So because of that, he had to be like us in every way. So because you and I have a book in heaven, guess what? He had to have a book in heaven. That he came into the earth in a body to fulfill and do the will of God that was recorded in that book by living out and fleshing out in a body what was written in that book. So you need to know that's what we're here for. If you want to know what you're here for, you are here for one reason, to fulfill what was written in the book of heaven about you. And let me just say this. I believe that when we stand before the Lord, our judgment will not be this little sin and that little sin, my judgment will be, how much of my book did I fulfill? How much of my book did I complete? Now, that little sin may have kept me from fulfilling portions of my book, but the bottom line is, I'm going to be judged and evaluated by how much of my book did I fulfill that was written in heaven. Are you with me here? Now, the Bible says... In, there again, in Daniel 7, verse 10, the court was seated or came into session and the books were open. Why were the books open? Because what we do when we say, God, I want what's in my book. And we began to say before him with revelation and understanding, this is what I want. This is what I've been called to. This is what I've been created for. You are actually presenting cases into the courts of heaven. See, cases always are presented into the courts of heaven from the books that are there as well. Because the court was seated and the books were open. And I'm not going to go too deeply into that this morning, but here's what I do want you to see. One of the problems for us fulfilling what's in our book is simply this. Our books are not open. You see, you have a book. But if you don't have divine revelation of what's in your book, it could be because your book's not yet open. And if your book is not open in the spirit realm, then watch this, you have no ability of knowing what you were actually put here for. And so you try this, and then you try that, and you think, well, this might be a good idea, well, this might be a good idea, and you're frustrated because nothing ever seems to work out because watch this, 
you don't know what you're here for because your book's not open. So you have to know how to get your book open so that you can present that before the Lord in the courts of heaven because you can only come into the courts of heaven based on what's written in your books. Okay, I want you to stay with me on that one. So what we have to do is get our books open. See, everybody's running around trying to get somebody to prophesy to them about what's in their book. Can I tell you something? Watch what I'm about to say. When your book is open, you won't care if anybody prophesies to you or not. Because you're going to know what you are put here for. See, and I want you to hear this. The one of the reasons you never get a prophetic word is because prophets can only prophesy from an open book. If your book is not open, they'll go down the line and prophesy to this one, prophesy to this one, prophesy to this one, but won't say a word to you because they cannot prophesy to you if your book's not open. I'll show that to you in just a moment. So it's each person's responsibility to get their book open so that they can know what they were put into the planet for and why you're here in a body. So that then cases initially can be presented in the courts of heaven from what's written in your book. Is that making sense to you at all? Okay, now watch this. It's for us personally, but it's also for churches. Do you know that the embassy has a destiny written in the books of heaven before time began? I promise you it's true that God ordained the embassy church to fulfill certain things in the earth before time began. And it's up to us to begin to discover what's in the books concerning the embassy so that it can be brought into the courts of heaven. Everything that would legally resist it is removed so that all that God said concerning the embassy can become a reality. And this is true in every dimension of life. Now, here's what I want to do for a few moments. I want to talk to you about how to get your book open. I mean, I've just really, real quickly established you have a book. Okay? And everything that has a kingdom purpose has a book. Watch this. We're not just making this up. And I, I, I want to say this. We don't, we don't create destiny. We discover destiny. And you discover destiny by understanding what's in your book. So let me give you three realms, three issues that are critical to, to discovering what's in your book. The first one is found in Isaiah 29. Isaiah chapter 29. Let me show you issues about, about discovering what's in your book by getting your book open. Isaiah chapter 29. And let me just read in verse, verse uh, 10. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets, and has covered your heads, namely the seers. So he's saying those that are supposed to have revelation, it said God has put a deep sleep on, over them so that the eyes the prophets cannot see and the, and the head of the seers, they're covered with, so that their eyes are covered and they can't, they can't discern. Watch this. The whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men delivered to one who is literate, saying, Read this, please. And he said, I cannot, for it is sealed. Then the book is delivered to one who is illiterate, saying, Read this. And he says, I am not literate. So watch what he's saying. He's saying, he's saying they bring a book, but because it's sealed, those who are supposed to be able to read can't read it. And those who are even not supposed to be able to read can't read it because it's sealed. Watch this. And he says because it's sealed, watch, the prophets can't prophesy. Because it's, it's sealed, the seers can't see. I want you to see that. Again, one of the reasons there is no prophetic word so often over a city, over a province, over a church, over an individual is not because there's not a book concerning it. It's because the book is sealed. That's what it's saying here. So it needs to be opened. 
Okay, now he's going to tell us why this book is sealed. Watch what he says here. Verse, uh, verse 12, no, verse 13. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men. Now watch what he's saying. He's saying the reason this book is sealed and there is no prophetic revelation about what's in the book is because of false worship. Saying, he's saying the reason there's a deep sleep, the reason the prophets are not able to read the book, and the seers are not able to perceive what's in the books, and the books are sealed instead of open, is because these people are singing all the right songs, but their heart is not toward me. They're drawing near me with their lips, they're singing the words off the screen but there's no real worship coming before me. So watch this. If that's what seals the book is false worship, then what opens the book is true worship. I want you to hear this. See, it's not an accident that when we worship with a, with a sincere and a genuine heart, it's not an accident that all of a sudden prophetic understanding starts coming. I mean, we know this. I mean, I've been in this since, since the 1970s. When you worship, all of a sudden you start picking up things in the Spirit. Why? Because books are opening. See, true worship opens books. It causes, it causes things to begin to open up so that those have, who have an ear to hear, they start hearing. Those who have eyes to see, they start seeing. Those who have a heart to perceive, they start discerning and perceiving. Why? Because books are opening in the spirit realm. And all of a sudden we can begin to release prophetic words, prophetic understanding. Why? Because books are opening that we are perceiving from. Are you getting this? See, this is another dynamic so that we begin to understand what's happening as we release true worship. That's why true worship is so important. Because as we're worshiping, we all know this is true. Any of us that have an inkling of prophetic in us, you know that when you start to worship, you start picking up things in the Spirit about the service, about the place, about the city, whatever it is. You start picking this stuff up because it's the worship that is unlocking the books and causing us to perceive. Are you getting this? You see, so often whenever I come into a city, and I'm in sometimes several every week, somebody says, sometimes a pastor will call me or, or whoever, well, what's God saying to you? Well, normally I don't know. And I hate to tell them I don't know, but I know that when I get into the service, I will know. Why? Because I realize that when I get into that atmosphere of worship, that the book concerning that place will start to unlock. And I can start reading from it. And I can start discerning what's in it. Because true worship. So here's my, here's my admonition. If you want to know what's in your book, become a worshiper. Because as you really worship, not just, not just say words, not just sing songs, but, but really from your heart draw near to Him. I promise you, your book will begin to open. You'll begin to discern what's, what's written in that book. And you'll start having revelation concerning what God wrote in your book before time began. And not just your book, but literally over the embassy, if you will. Over Prince Albert. Over Saskatchewan. Over Canada. Whatever, whatever dimension, whatever call is on a, a place, then all of a sudden the book of that area will begin to start opening up so that we can then, watch this, come into the courts and present cases based on what's in the book in the courts of heaven. Because the court was seated and the books were open. Are you, are you following me on this? So that's the first thing that opens the book. The second thing, that opens book is found in Revelation 22. Revelation chapter 22. And verse, I believe, is verse 10. Let me show you what else opens your book. 
See, how many of you would like to have your book open? So you can really, so that, watch this. Listen, confusion leaves your life. Listen, there's nothing better than knowing what you were put on the earth for. I'm telling you, it's so frustrating when you think you're just here going through the motions, just, you know, getting up in the morning, go earn a living, come back at night, whatever. There's nothing more frustrating than feeling lifeless and without purpose. God wants to remove the purpose, purposelessness from us, the confusion from us, and cause us to know what our real divine destiny is. It changes everything. It changes everything. Revelation 22, verse 10. Here's what he says. He said, And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. So watch. What else opens books? Here's what the angel said to John. Don't seal the book, because it's time. So timing opens books. Okay. Not, 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 what's it? There's three T's actually here. True worship, number one. Secondly, timing. The timing of the Lord opens books. So, so here's the deal. When it's time for the book to be fulfilled, many times, the book will open. Why? Because now it's time. And all of a sudden, you'll start having revelation, understanding, insight about certain things that you haven't understood before because now it's time. See, what have you been doing up to that? Doing what you know to do, being faithful, being diligent, being, being, being uh, uh, obedient in all the things of the Lord. But then all of a sudden, one day, there's a new revelation that comes. Why? Because it's time. And you don't know it, but what just happened was a book opened up. A book that had been sealed was opened up. Now it's time for you to step into the fullness of that which was written in that book because the timing of the Lord is now. See, I'm telling you, the more I study this, the more I see how much is connected to books in the spirit realm that began to open so that we can begin to step into what God has actually called us to. There's books, right now in my life, there's books opening up. And they're opening up at such a, 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 a pace that is actually scaring me. Because watch this, as the books open, it's requiring me to take a step of faith to move into what I'm, what I'm seeing. And the fear of the Lord is grabbing hold of me. The fear of the Lord is grabbing hold of me. I just had a dream. I just did this big conference that was a huge step of faith for me on unlocking destiny from the courts of heaven. It was, a, it was a humongous success in every way. And then I have a dream right after the conference. And Dutch Sheets, which is a friend of mine, looks at me in the dream and he does this. He taps his watch with his fingers. And he says to me, you're in the middle of the timing of God. And then he says, you are to do five more of these conferences through the U.S. Well, I was like, we just made this one a success. That was a huge step of faith for me. Why do I have to do five more now? But I knew it was a book was opening. Watch this. And then I had another dream where I won't tell you who it was. One of the candidates for president called me on the phone and told me, you must do these conferences. Watch this. Because they were going to shift things in the spirit so that the right one gets elected to be president of the U.S. Now that, that puts it on a whole other level. i got to do these conferences because we're going to shift the atmosphere over America because this is the time. And guess what's happening? A book is opening of Revelation. And it's, it's connecting me to the timing of God that is requiring me to take a step of faith that I would rather not take. Because I like comfort. I like comfort. See, uh, we, we used to teach faith like this, this, this nice little, simple little thing. That, uh, no, no, listen. Faith will cause you to die a thousand deaths. A thousand deaths. I remember hearing a man one time, he said this. He said, I have this sense that before I get done what I know I'm supposed to do, it's going to take me to my gut. I remember hearing him say that. 
What he was saying was, this step of faith I'm moving into, it is going to require everything I've got on the inside of me to get this done. See, see, don't think, oh, just confess a few things here and there and it'll be okay. No, real faith, when books open and revelation comes, will cost you dearly as you step out to fulfill everything God has said to do. Because a book opened with revelation. Is that making sense to you? And it requires us to move in the timing of God that that book is revealing at that time. I remember years ago I made a statement. God said to Saul, He said, obedience is better than sacrifice. Watch this. Today it's obedience, tomorrow it's sacrifice. In other words, we got to move when God says move. He's the one that tells us what to do and how to do it. See, so whenever I started telling some people, so tell them, God's telling me to do five more of these conferences. Those, some of those closest to me, here's what they said. How are you going to finance that? I said, I don't know. I didn't know how I was going to finance the first one. I could see it in my wife's eyes. No, I was actually telling her I was in Africa. I was telling her on the phone. I could, I could hear it in the absence of her voice. <laughs> when I was telling her, and I knew I could feel the resistance coming through the phone. Not, not because, not, not just, just because she's just a human being. And she's saying, we're going to put everything on the line to do this. Watch this. And I said, this is what I said to her. I said, sweetie, I said, here's the issue. I said, I feel it's a mandate from God. I said, I have to do it regardless of whether it works or not. Because a book has opened with revelation that says, this is the timing of God. It's time for us to move by faith into what God has for us. See, here's the deal. So many people won't do that. Because if it doesn't make sense logically, then that's the final line for them. I got news for you. That is not the final line with God. Ever. Ever, you have to move at His Word. You have to move at the revelation that's coming from an open book. This is what I used to tell people. It's interesting because I birthed churches. I planted churches. I've seen God do some great things. But watch this. I said, it's interesting because in the beginnings, because you don't have any money, the Word of God is the final issue. I said, then all of a sudden when you have a little money, now it's based on finances and not what God is saying. And it should never be. We should never move away from, this is the word of the Lord. And whatever He says to do, we will do it, regardless of whether we have something in the bank or not. Watch this. God said to me, He said, you're going to have to make a choice. You have to live either by what's in your hand or by what's in your heart. And I said, Lord, I choose to live by what's in my heart. Because I want you to hear something. Those who change the world live by what's in their heart, not what's in their hand. Because if what's in my hand is what I make the final decision from, I'll never change the world. But if I'll believe God, and make decisions based on what's in my heart that He has put into my heart. Because a book has opened, and I understand now what He wants in this timing and in this season. We might just change the world. Amen? And guess what? That's what He's put the ecclesia, the, the church in the earth for, is to change the world. Amen? Let me give you the, the third thing that opens books. Okay, we got two so far. Number one, it's true worship. Number two, it's the timing of the Lord. Number three, it's found in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, and let me just read it to you real quickly. He says, verse 1, 
And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, John said, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seals. And then he looks and sees, instead of a lion, he sees a lamb. Now watch this. What's he saying here? We know the seals, of these, this, this, this book uh, uh, sealed with seven seals. We know that when it opened, the judgments start to come into the earth. Why? Because it's judicial activity coming out of heaven based on what's in the books. That's what's happening here. Now watch what I'm about to say. But what opened, and why is John weeping? Because he knows until that book opens, things are locked up in the spirit and the ultimate thing that God wants to accomplish in the earth will not be done because there's a book that's sealed. You need to know that. As long as there are sealed books, we're at a stalemate. We're stymied. Things will not move in the Spirit. What are we asking when we're asking for the logjam to be broken? We're asking for books to be opened. And what's what I'm about to say? What opened this book? It was tears of intercession connected to the finished works of the cross. Tears of intercession. See, John is weeping because they want him to weep. Because an angel comes and shows him this sealed book. And John knows this book has to be opened. And they show him that because they need tears of intercession connected to what Jesus has already done on the cross. Because watch this, what is intercession about? It's about pulling into reality everything Jesus died for. That's what we do with our intercession. We are pulling into reality everything Jesus died for. And I want you to know that the thing that opens books, thirdly, is tears of intercession. I want you to hear something. Your book will never be open until you get serious enough with God and in your desperation that God begins to open the books. That's just true. Until there's, there's a supernatural passion that grabs hold of you and says, Lord, I want what's in my book. I don't want to live the rest of my days wondering and aimlessly. I don't want to do just good things. I want what's in my book. I want to fulfill the reason I was. Watch this. Will until there is intercession and tears that open the book of that church. A city will not come into its destiny until there is intercessors that weep the Lord between, as it were, the porch and the altar so that a book can be opened. So that now we can... It never so that we can pray not just our good ideas. That we can begin to call into reality the destiny of Prince Albert, of Saskatchewan, of whatever sphere of authority God has given. That that all of a sudden, because a book opens, we can begin to make cases in the courts of heaven from these books. Because nothing happens until books open. See, it's really interesting in Daniel 7.10, the court was seated and the books were open. That's that third dimension. You can pray to the Father without this. You can pray to Him as friend without this. But you can't come into the courts of heaven and to the judicial activity of heaven without books being open. Because it's open books that actually began to allow us to ask of God from revelation what He intended all along.
And that's on a personal level all the way up to a national level. Does this make sense to you? Let me, let me finish with one, with one scripture. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. In verse 25. We'll probably go more to this later on, but he says, here's what Isaiah is prophesying from the Lord. He's speaking the word of the Lord. He said, I, even I am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. Watch what he's about to say. State your case that you may be acquitted. In other words, this is courtroom. Now watch what he says. He says, your first father sinned, and your mediators, and just real briefly, that means those who have a right to present cases, have transgressed. They've transgressed. And watch this. As a result... The, the, I, I will profane the princes of the sanctuary. I will give Jacob to the curse and Israel to reproach. Watch what he says. He says, because you are not able to present cases in the courts, there's a curse that rests over a whole nation. Jacob is under a curse. Israel has a reproach on her. Princes of the sanctuary are profaned. Unwise faults, even leadership. Watch this. Why? Because you're not able to bring cases. And I don't want to go into all this, but here's what I want you, want you to see. He says, put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case. See, when he says, put me in remembrance, what's he saying? He's basically saying this. Present your case from what I've already written in the books of heaven about you. That's what he means by put me in remembrance. That your books have now opened. And as a result, you now have some realm of revelation of what God ordained for you to do. And as a result of that, you can put me in remembrance and you can say, Lord, you said this about me before time began. You said this about me before time began. This is at least a part of my kingdom purpose. So, Lord, I'm asking before your presence that what you said about me would be a reality. That I will not finish my life on this earth until everything you wrote in the book of heaven about me is done. And I put him in remembrance of what he said about me and what he wrote in the books of heaven concerning me. And there's a lot of other things in that scripture. I just wanted to see, you to see that peace. That's why the court is seated and the books are open. So that we can step into that third dimension. Amen. Would you stand up with me this morning? How many of you in this room would say, I want what's in my book? Listen, life is too short. Life is too short. I'm 57 now. I was just 18. I'm serious. How did I get from 18 to here? I don't know. Truly what his word says, that life is but a vapor. It's here and it's gone. Here's what it says. It's too short for me to waste it on my own good ideas. I want what's in my book. I want to understand what's in my book. And I want to live my life with purpose connected to what's in my book. Amen? How many of you in this room say, that's what I want to could I have the worship team come or have her, how you do that? And Because I really feel to do something this morning. Because watch this, I said three things, at least three things open books. True worship. Timing of the Lord. And tears of intercession. Open books. 
Listen, I want you to understand, you never find out what's in your book by this kind of an attitude. <laughs> not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It takes, it takes a seeking. It takes, it takes an aggression. It takes, it takes saying, Lord, more than life itself, I want what's in my book. More than life itself. And if that's your attitude this morning, I want you just to come down front here with me. Would you do that? And I want them just to begin to play, and I want you just to come down front. I'm just going to pray for you. I'm going to pray with you. Because watch, I still want what's in my book to this day. I'm beginning to live out some things I saw in my book 25 years ago. Before I'm through this weekend, I'm going to I'm going to also teach on how we dissolve curses because curses are designed to stop you from getting what's in your book. That's what curses are. Among other things, they are they are used by the enemy to stop you from what's in your book and and so we have to know how to step into the courts of heaven and dissolve those curses. Hallelujah. Just I want you just to just say to the Lord, say, Lord, I'm here today. And I want to say before you, with all sincerity, with all passion, Lord, I want what's in my book. And I want what's in the book of this house. I want the prophetic apostolic destiny fulfilled in my life, but fulfilled in the embassy church as well. I want, Lord, what's written in the books of heaven. So, Lord, I'm asking right now for the books to be opened. Lord, even as we worship you, that revelation began to erupt. Lord, let the timing of the Lord be released. And even that which is past timing, let it now come into place, Lord. And let me see and perceive what's written in the book. Lord, let tears of intercession be released. Let a new level of intercession come that unlocks books in heaven so that I can have even all that I was made for. I want, Lord, what's in my book. Thank you, Lord, for this, Lord. And I want to ask you guys just to worship. And I just want us just to worship. There's this one key, true worship, for just a few moments. True worship, true worship. We want what's in our book. Lord, even as they began to do this, I say over this house, there is an unlocking of a book. There's an unlocking of books, Lord. The books of the embassy church in heaven, Lord. There's an unlocking of the books, Lord. So that, Lord, not only do those that lead the work, but those that are a part of the work began to see and to understand what's in the books, Lord, so that there is a brand new level of agreement, a brand new level of unity of heart and of spirit to go after what is written in the books of heaven over the embassy, oh God. I thank you for doing this, Lord, right now. I thank you for doing this right now. So close to me that I can hardly move or breathe.